the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcome. Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This video is for linear algebra students who are going through orthogonality and least squares. However, you're pretty far away from reaching that point right now. So we are just setting up all the language and theory we'll need to get there. I just put out a video on the dot product and now we're gonna go into how to compute the length of a vector. Both of those topics, the dot product and the length of a vector are incredibly important when you start talking about how to create orthogonal vectors and really how to optimize when you're dealing with matrices. So let's go ahead and get into the length of a vector. While it may seem like somewhat of a short topic, it is a bit lengthy, no pun intended. It's just a lot of material that we need to get through so that we have the proper theory set up as we dive into orthogonality. So the norm of a vector. The norm, which is also called the length or the magnitude of a vector, is a non-negative scalar, which we use this notation right here. It looks like an absolute value, except it's not. It's got double bars instead of single bars, but it sort of operates like that. It gives you the size of a vector. And it's defined by the following. The magnitude of V, also known as the norm of V or the length of V, is defined to be the square root of the dot product of V with itself. And if you think about that dot product, you're multiplying the first entry of V by itself, and then adding to that the second entry of V multiplied by itself, and adding to that the third entry of V multiplied by itself, and so on and so forth down the line. And that's exactly what this is right here. It looks like the Pythagorean theorem, to be very honest with you, and it is highly related to that because if you think about the Pythagorean theorem, it tells you the length of the hypotenuse. So in two dimensions, that's exactly what this is. A little bit of a note before we move forward, we'll also be using the alternative form, the norm of V squared. That just takes the square root out of the scene, so you're looking at V dotted with V. It's just a, sometimes a faster notation or an alternative notation for V dot V. So that's just a heads up. Whenever you see V squared or the norm of V squared, that means V dot V. So let's go ahead and explain what the geometric meaning of the norm of V is for the vector V equals negative one, one, two. Now we could easily compute that. It's not too terrible, but what is the meaning of that? Well, the vector V is this vector right here. I went back one in the X1 direction, forward one in the X2 direction, and then up two units, which should actually technically land right about here in the X3 direction, just because the tilt to the axis there. Anyhow, but really the norm of that vector V is the length of that vector. That's all it really is. So again, whenever you're talking about the norm or the magnitude of a vector, you're really referring to the length of that vector. Again, this shouldn't be anything crazy. You should probably already know this because, well, you're likely in Calc 3 or have passed Calc 3. And just like we did for the dot product, we have a theorem for the properties of the norm of a vector. And there's actually more properties than these two we might have more as we move forward, but for right now, these are the only ones we really need. So suppose that C is a scalar and U is a vector. There's the non-negativity property, which is that the norm of a vector is always greater than or equal to zero. That is because the norm of the vector is just the square root of the sum of the squares of the entries of the vector. So that should make sense. And the norm of a vector is zero if and only if the vector itself is zero. Again, you're adding up squares on the inside of that radical. And so therefore the only way that sum of non-negative numbers is ever going to become zero is if you're adding up a bunch of zeros. And then this property right here is a very nice property. The norm of a scalar times a vector is actually the absolute value of the scalar times the norm of the vector. That's very important because the notation that we use here, which is a double bars for the norm, 
very much looks like an absolute value. And because we know the norm will never return a negative number, it should make sense that if you have a scaled version of your vector, it should still not be negative. The norm is just measuring its length and it's gonna be the absolute value of that scaling factor times the magnitude of u. Again, these proofs are usually left for the student as a homework exercise. So again, I will not do that here because I don't want to steal your thunder. And these are really not too terrible. Now, as I note below, this is not an exhaustive list of the properties of the norm. I only include the properties we need at the moment. More will be introduced as we move forward. So, so far we've introduced the norm or magnitude of a vector and a couple properties. That's it. Now, along comes this definition here, and this definition is actually a really nice definition. Definition of a unit vector is a vector whose norm is one. And probably the most common unit vectors that you know just from your calculus course are the basis vectors for R cubed. However, those are not the only basis vectors for R cubed that are unit vectors. We can actually find other unit vectors that will form a basis for R cubed and we will do that in future videos. For right now, just know that any vector of unit length is called a unit vector. And a skill that we're gonna practice as we move forward is the skill of normalizing a vector. That is, if I give you a vector that does not have a unit length to it, you can actually normalize it. By the way, normalizing happens all the time. You rescale something to where it fits within a nice percentage scale, for example. Actually, that's a great example. Suppose you took an exam and the exam was worth 123 points. Your instructor then normalizes your score. Let's say you got 100 out of 123 points. Your instructor takes your score, divides it by the normalizing factor, which is the actual total available points on that, and this gives you your percentage. And that would be the normalized score. The non-normalized would be 100, but that's not your actual percentage. The normalized score would be 0.813 roughly, or in other words, 81.3%. And that makes more sense to us because it's scaled appropriately for our brains to kind of manage and put into perspective. And that's exactly what normalizing is. I give you a vector V, and I want you to normalize it, you'll divide by the length of V. And that will give you a new vector, which is called the normalized version of the vector. And the process is called normalizing. When you normalize a vector, you actually make it a unit vector. For example, if I gave you a vector 3, 7, and I asked you to normalize that or write it as a unit vector, all you would need to do is find out what is the magnitude of that vector. And then your normalized vector would be the original vector divided by the magnitude of that original vector. It's scaled down. And when you do that, you get this vector right here, three over root 58 and seven over root 58. Now, if you were to take a look at the norm of U, remember that's the square root of the sum of the squares of its entries. Adding those up, you get one. There you go. So when you normalize, you're actually forcing a vector into a unit vector state. Visually, what you're doing is you have this point in space called the origin. You go over one, two, three units and up seven. And you have your original vector there. And then you just wanna talk about the normalized version or essentially the version of that vector with length one. And that could be, for example, that. I'm not saying it is, but it could be that. But it's always in the same direction as the original vector. The only thing that changes is the length because you're dividing your original vector, V, by a scalar. So you're just shortening your vector up or possibly lengthening the vector to where it has a unit length. But no matter what, when you normalize, you get a unit vector in the same direction as your original vector. Find a unit vector basis for the subspace listed right here, the span of negative one, one, two. Well, the span of a set of vectors is a subspace. We know that since this set here is a single vector, I know the span of this set or the subspace generated by this set can be generated just by this single vector here, any scalar multiple of it. 
I'll start by naming the vector V and then I'll find the magnitude of it because I'm going to divide V by the magnitude of itself. Now we actually found the magnitude of that vector earlier, so not a big deal. As a unit vector, we get this. That is a vector in the same direction as the original vector V, just with a unit length. So that will be our basis for the subspace spanned by our original vector. There we go, the basis is just the set of the vector U. Now when you're talking about lengths or magnitudes of vectors, in Rn, you can't get away from the conversation about distance. That's going to be a requirement when we move into the next video, so we might as well introduce it here. For vectors u and v in Rn, the distance between those two vectors, written as distance u comma v, is the length of the vector u minus v. That is, whenever you see this notation, it is the same thing as saying what is the magnitude of u minus v? It's the length of that vector u minus v. This is best seen in two dimensions. There's the vectors u and v. We want to find the distance between u and v, and that would be this distance right here. However, that doesn't seem to work with what we've written above. That's a distance between the tips of u and v, but again, it sure doesn't look like it's the magnitude of u minus v. Remember, u minus v is the same thing as u plus a negative v. So if I take that u and I add to it a negative v, we know from vector addition, u plus a negative v would be tip to tail addition, or in other words, we could use the parallelogram rule and just draw a line from beginning to end and that would be the resulting vector. And you can see that is actually what we have there. That's the distance. So it sure does look like that would be the measurement for the distance between U and V. Compute the distance between the vectors. Now I'm not going to bother drawing these out because I'm terrible at drawing in three dimensions, but we happen to know the distance between the tips of u and v is defined to be the magnitude of u minus v, which is the magnitude of that vector there, which is square root of 11. That's the distance between those vectors. Technically the tips of those vectors, but whatever. So as you could probably tell as we go into this material, it's very computationally heavy. There's not a lot of theory here. It's just compute, compute. A lot of students will feel as though this is a very nice change from what linear algebra has been if you're going through a really good solid theoretical linear algebra course. And it is true. Actually, you're in a unit of material right now that's gonna be heavy on the computational side. I will still sneak in theories and I'll still sneak in proofs. And you'll probably have some of those on your homework or exams or something like that. But the bulk of this material is meant for application. All right, all that being said, I'm done with this video. And I hope to see you in the next video. Have a wonderful day and be a great human being. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes. Obstacles getting in our way comes. Effects more than we can sometimes see. Things for what they are and work together until you feel at peace. Listen close. Too much that isn't cold Sure, you may really hurt inside It doesn't justify you to speak too loud and cry